Praise the Lord. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Upper Room Fellowship of Jesus Christ. Uh, my name is Steve Aguirre, and I'm here to, Lord willing, share God's word. And before we go any further, let's give this all to the Lord. Heavenly Father, in the name of your glorious Son, Jesus Christ, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for your, uh, the gift of your word. And we thank you for the gift of salvation that comes through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And I just pray right now that you um, you be in total control over this study, that you uh, prepare every heart and mind to be open to receiving your truth and give us revelation. <laughs> speak through me and let me not speak on my own resources and um, just bring glory to your name through this study in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. And if anyone is not speaking, I'd ask you to mind you. You be mindful of your mute button so that we we have a clean recording and that everyone can hear clearly. But if you do have a question, please jump in. This is meant to be interactive. Praise the Lord. We are in campus study number 50. 50 is a big number in the Bible, Jubilee. It's a, a, a Sabbath of Sabbaths and a wonderful celebration, but I don't, I'm not going into that today. Just happen to rem remember that number. Today, we are in the next part of the Chosen Generation series, part 14. And again, our foundational scripture is 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people, but now are the are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Praise the Lord. In other words, they had these special people in the Old Testament that were separated from the rest, the children of Israel. And now in the modern day in the New Testament, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, all who would believe are now the chosen children of God. And those stories of the Israelites are really spiritual stories for us today. And that's why we look at the Old Testament, because as it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman, I may add, of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. Praise the Lord. Last week, we were in Genesis chapter 28. Here's some highlights for us. Verses 1 and 2, Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him, and charged him, and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. We know the children of Canaan, the daughters of Canaan, those people were part of a cursed generation, and God did not want them to mix. Arise, go to Padan Aram, and to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there, from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. And so that's what he set out to do. And verse 10 and through 12, now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set, and he took one of the stones of that place and put it on his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Amen. A uh, quick uh, note of interest here. I can't guarantee it's true, but I believe uh, there, there is tradition that says there's the stone of scone, which they believe is the same stone that Jacob used, and it has been sitting in royalty, uh, like under the throne of the king or queen of England and Ireland or Scotland, somewhere over there going back and forth for centuries now. I don't know how much truth there is to that, but maybe someone who's interested in that kind of stuff can look it up. Uh, but, you know, people look to things to try to get power and and all of that, when the real power comes from trusting in Jesus and the Holy Spirit that we receive when we do, none of those physical things are going to make us uh, bring us salvation or anything else. But anyway, I digress. 
And then we jump forward to verses 16 and 17. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other, none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Amen. And there's a lot of studies on gates of heaven, portals that get to heaven and all those kind of things. Again, faith in Jesus Christ it was, is what brings us into the kingdom of heaven. And that's what matters. Praise the Lord. And uh, he called the place Bethel, which is the house of God. Bethel. And let's see. Then he goes and he meets Laban. And we pick it up in verses 15 through 27. Then Laban said to um, Genesis 29, Laban said to Jacob, because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel's Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now, Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your daughter, your younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give it to another man. Stay with me. He didn't tell him what was coming. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled that I may go into her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. They were covered, and then they went into the room, and it was no light. So, boom, that's what happened. And Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as maid. So it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this that you've done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, it must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week, and we will give you this one also for the service which you will serve me still another seven years. We talked about what goes around comes around. God does Give us experiences, not to condemn us, but just to teach us so we can understand what it's like on the other side of maybe something we've done because we, we don't understand unless we taste it ourselves. But it's all out of his love and his training for us to never repeat these kind of things in the future. It's all good, praise the Lord. And finally, um, verses 28 through 32, then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week so he gave him his daughter, Rachel, his wife also. And Laban gave his maid, Bilhah, to his daughter, Rachel, as a maid. Uh, then Jacob also went into Rachel, he, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Laban still another seven years. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, the Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. And we got into these first son's names, the first four of them. Reuben meant, behold, a son, a son of vision. Uh, then we went into Simeon, he who hears or snub-nosed. Levi, joined or joiner. Judah, praised, let him be praised. And if you want to go into how it fit with the scripture, you can go back to last week's study study number 49, and that's why we covered all of those. Before we get into chapter 30, is there any questions, comments, or revelation on anything we covered last week? All right, Lord, then guide us into new truth today. Praise the Lord. We pick it up in Genesis chapter 30, verse 1. Now, when Rachel saw that she bore no Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. Again, it was very important for women to have children. That was the most important uh, thing to their lives and to be barren was not a good thing. And now Leah has already given him four sons. And so she's looking to Jacob to make it happen. 
And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel. And he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you uh, the fruit of the womb? So she said, here is my maid Bilhah. Go into her and she will bear a child on my knees that I also may have children by her. Does this sound familiar? If you remember a few studies back when Abraham um, was promised to have a child and it wasn't happening, it wasn't happening. So Sarah said, go into my maid, Hagar, and I'll have a child through her. And it happened, but it wasn't the one that God wanted, that God promised. And so we see that there's a pattern here, again, that this was the way that they um, they would by proxy have children because they if they couldn't bear their own. And so here we see uh, Rachel doing the same thing. And she gave him Bilhah, her maid, his wife, and Jacob went into her. And Bilhah conceived and bore us Jacob a son. And Rachel said, God has judged my case, and he has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. Amen. Praise the Lord. And we look at the meaning of these names, these 12 names that were very important in the establishment of the nation of Israel. So Dan, again, remember, God has judged my case. He's also heard my voice and given me a son. Now, the meaning of Dan is judge. Remember, she said, God has judged my case. And so she named him Dan, which means judge. Amen. Questions, comments? All right, so now I'm going to see if I can get engage those who are with us today to come think of what the meaning of these names are going to be as we read the scriptures. Verses 7 through 8, And Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, With great wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. Anyone want to take a stab? It's okay if you don't. All right. So with great wrestlings, and I have prevailed. Naphtali means my wrestlings, crafty. So she named him because she wrestled through this whole situation with her sister. Praise the Lord. Verses 9 through 11. When Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob as a wife. We got a competition going on here, a sibling rivalry and this desire to outdo one another for his attention and for victory. And so now she's going to do the same thing Rachel did and bring her maid and give her to Jacob. And Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, a troop comes. So she called his name Gad. Now, in this definition, it's not straight up. You have to look at the root of the, the name. And the root of that name comes from the verb gadad, which means to cut, invade, and expose. And remember, she said a troop comes, like an invasion, because now six children have come forth, four from her and two from her maid, and she's got a troop coming, coming to just dominate here in this competition. Any questions, comments? All right, verses 12 through 13. And Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Oh, that was the fifth one. I'm sorry. Then Leah said, I am happy for the daughters will call me blessed. So she called his name Asher. You might want to take a stab at I'm happy for the daughters will call me blessed. Asher means happy. And she was happy. Now she's got six. The first five, the troop was a basketball team. Now we got six. I don't know what that counts for in sports. But now we got six from her side. Verses 14 through 15. Now Reuben went in the days of, of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband would you also take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, therefore, 
he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. Wow, what a competition here. Making bargaining. What in the earth, what on earth is all this mandrake stuff going on about? Why is the why are these mandrakes so valuable that Rachel would say that you get Jacob for the night? Just give me those mandrakes. Let's look into that a little bit before we keep going with our story. Mandrakes, what are they bargaining for? All right, mandrakes are a plant and the roots of these plants. And the plant isn't as important as the roots are. They are something that's still uh, coveted today. And uh, so let's look at what is, the, what is the significance of why Rachel wanted those mandrakes? Why were they even dealing with mandrakes over there in Laban's house? And what is the big deal? So I went to Wikipedia and it says, I just took a snippet. There's a lot on, on mandrakes in Wikipedia, but this is what stood out to me. Because mandrakes contain delirient, hallucinogenic, tropane alkaloids. And the shape of their roots often resembles human figures. That they have been associated with magic rituals throughout history, including present day contemporary pagan traditions such as Wicca and Odinism. All right, so remember that Laban's house comes from Ur, from all the family before Abraham left that area, and there was tons of pagan traditions going on, and we know also that idolatry, all these things happen in those areas, and so they obviously worshipped and used these, these mandrakes for something that they thought they were going to get something out of. And so we can start to see the picture as we see that uh, they worship these things for fertility, for having children. Since the root looks a lot like a person, it's sort of like when you take up those mandrakes, you're bringing forth a child or a person. And so that's a real mandrake root right there. And uh, it's still very popular today. I think it was in... Um, uh, Harry Potter, and they were doing something with that and their little magic and everything else. And now we can see a little more clearly why would Rachel want those mandrakes and why would Leah want them? Remember, Leah had stopped bearing children. And so she was now using her maid and, and, and Rachel has never born children. And now she says, okay, well, having Jacob is not doing it. So I need these mandrakes. So I'll let Jacob go to Leah and I'll get these mandrakes and see if now I can have kids. Was it really going to happen? Was that going to be the solution? We know not. But that's what they believed. That's what they were looking to, their own idols and so forth. Questions, comments, revelations. Maybe somebody knows more about mandrakes. Anything. Okay, hearing none, we pick it up at verse 16. When Jacob came out of the field... In the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come into me. Leah's all excited about this, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night. What a competition. And God listened to Leah and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. It wasn't the mandrakes. She gave those away. God answered Leah. And now a fifth son plus two from her maid is seven. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I have given my maid to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. Anyone want to guess based on her statement what Issachar means? God has given me my wages because I have given my maid to my husband. Issachar means man of hire. He is wages. There is recompense. So she somehow believes that that uh, because she did that, God is blessing her. Um, so that's what that means. Verses 19 and 20. Now then Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. And Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Amen. So God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me. Zebulun means instance of exaltation, which is looking up to God, glorious dwelling place. She wants Jacob to dwell with her because she's given him six sons plus two with her maid. 
And so that's the meaning of Zebulun. Questions, comments? Hopefully we can see, we talked about at the end of last week's study, how purposeful the names uh, really are in the Old Testament. And they can be for us today as well. If we seek God and we ask him to guide us to the name for our children, God would do the same with us today. Even better, I believe, because if we're spirit-led, um, we would get the right name for our children. Praise the Lord. Verse 21, afterwards she bore a daughter and called her name Dina. Now, some say Dinah, Dina. Um, now, interesting here, because of all the boys that were born, there's all this talk and and naming after the feelings and all of that. But in this case, there's none of that. So what's the name Dina mean? It's sort of like the, the guys get all the, the, uh, the big descriptions and all that. No, she just had a daughter. We see how things were for women in those days. But God is, is righteous and just. And he, he does wonderful things with the women, regardless of how the culture will look at it, uh, as we know. Um, used women powerfully throughout the Old Testament and the New as well, praise the Lord. But in this case, she bore a daughter, called her name Dina, and the name Dina means judge in the female sense, judgment. How does that tie in? That's a prophecy, brothers and sisters. That is, there obviously she had nothing to say about having a daughter, nothing that she was feeling, but God was involved anyway. And we will see in the future, as we continue on this study, not too far in the future, how God uses Dina to bring judgment on the peoples. And so we'll remember that in the back of our minds as we go forward. Questions, comments, revelations? All right, hearing none, let's go on. Verses 22 through 24, then God remembered Rachel. You see, it's God who decides who's going to have children, not me, none of that stuff. And God listened to her and opened her womb. She hasn't had one yet. There's already like 10 kids out there. Leah has six. She, her maid had two. Rachel's maid had two. Now God opens her womb. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach because it was a reproach not to be able to have children. So she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. She's already prophesying that that's not the only one she's going to have. And so Joseph means increaser. May he add. Amen. Praise the Lord. And that's deep because not only is it about her having another son, but God would use Joseph to cause the Israelites to go from a small family into a massive nation, increase and all that under his leadership in the future. Again, it's a prophecy as well. Praise the Lord. Any questions, comments, revelation? Okay, then we'll keep moving along. Verses 25 through 32. And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children from, for whom I have served you and let me go for you know my service which I have done for you. He has now worked for Laban for 14 years and one for each, uh, seven for each wife. And Laban said to him, please stay, if I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. And believe it or not, like wherever God places his children, and uh, he'll give favor to those who are over them, who, who work places or schools, whatever the case, God does that. And so Laban recognizes that he's found favor he had very little when, when uh, Jacob came, and now he's very he's flourishing. He's very successful, as we're going to see in the word. Then he said, name me your wages, and I will give it. This is what Laban is saying to Jacob. Tell me what you want, and I'll, I'll give it to you if you stay. So Jacob said to him, you know how I have served you and how I've, your livestock have been with me. For what you had before I came was little and it has increased to a great amount. 
The Lord has blessed you since my coming. And now when shall I also provide for my own house? So he said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall give me, you not give me anything. Remember how Abraham said that to the kings as well. They wanted to give him something. No, he's not going to take it. He's going to get whatever he gets from the Lord. If you will do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep your flocks. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from there all the speckled and spotted sheep. Now, in those days, a valuable, well, probably even today, right? Even we have animals, purebreds are the ones <clears throat> that are valuable. And these speckled and spotted sheep were not valuable to, to people who owned sheep in those days. They wanted pure, clean, uh, un, unspotted uh, flocks. And so Jacob is saying, let me pass through all your flock today, removing from there all the speckled and spotted sheep and all the brown ones among the lambs, because they wanted the white lambs, and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and these shall be my wages. Amen. So now Jacob is making Laban a deal. I'm not going to take anything from you, but the ones you don't want that you're discarding anyway, those things that are not perfect, that have spots and speckles and they're brown and all that, let me have those and you keep all the nice white clean ones and all that and that will be my wages. So let's talk a little bit about spotted and speckled. Praise the Lord. Speckled and spotted. Spots in the Bible, really in a spiritual sense, right? Because we're not looking at the physical here. Spots can equal sin. And we're, I'm not just going to say that's my idea. Let's look at some examples in the New Testament that kind of tie together spots, speckles, and all that and sin. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 12 through 14 says, But these, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of, of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, speckles, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. Amen. Now, these are people he's calling spots, but it's not only that. James chapter 1, verse 27 says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the fathers is this, and the father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Amen. As we walk in this world, we would pick up dust, right? And our feet, they were wearing sandals. That's why they always washed each other's feet. Jesus washed everybody's feet and said, you only need your feet washed and you'll be clean because we we sin as we walk in this world because we still have flesh. And we then we pray for one another and we're, we're washing spiritually each other's feet and then we're clean again. That's the whole point, to get the spots off of us. And it's prayer, confession and prayer is what gets the spots off of us. So now... Jacob is the one who's taking all the spotted and speckled and brown and dirty ones away from Laban, which Laban is happy to get rid of. Now, there's a prophecy that ties this all into the spiritual promise of what Jacob is doing in the physical. Think of Jacob as a type of Christ. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3, was a prophecy of someone to come. It said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the joy of joy of oil, the oil of joy for the mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, 
that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Amen. Praise the Lord. So whether it's sickness and pain, mourning and loss, or just mourning over our own unhealthy, unspiritual condition, our self, self, sinful flesh that we see in ourselves, all of that, that's who God is looking for. He's gathering up the broken, the, the sinners, the the, the, the ones that the world wants to throw away, the foolish things of this world, he gathers together. They complain to Jesus that he was hanging out with sinners and tax collectors, prostitutes and all those people. But that is the broken people that he's talking about. The ones who can't, who aren't all powerful and famous in this world, the ones who know they need a savior. And that's who he gathers together. All the oddballs of the world Praise the Lord, God, get, Jesus gathers together like Jacob is gathering here. And then we see that was the prophe, prophecy and we see in the New Testament, Jesus himself in Luke 4, chapter verses 16 through 21. So he being Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath. This is thousands of years later, or at least hundreds of years later on the Sabbath day, and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, the book that I just read from. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Amen. Praise the Lord. Captives, we know the word tells us if we sin, we're, we're, we're a slave to sin, we're captive to it, we can't get away from it. All the things that, that break us down, he has brought that day to deliver us all. And he fulfilled it right there. Revelation, the end of the Bible, the last book of the Bible, chapter 7, verse 9 verse through 17. After these things, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, not just one biological country standing before the throne and before the Lamb, that Lamb is Jesus, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. Tribulation is what not only a historical thing that's be basically beginning now and wash their robes. It's also something we go through ourselves when we cry out to God and wash their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. All those spots on our clothing, our spiritual robe, all of that is made clean, made white with the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen. Praise the Lord. I hope we can see Jacob is making a deal with Laban. And Jesus makes a deal on this earth. He takes all the broken all the blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who 
are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled, praise the Lord. That is who God is taking up and taking to, to redeem for himself and making them clean with his blood so that we can celebrate with him forever. Praise the Lord. Any questions, comments, revelations over anything I just shared? All right, I think we're going to be able to finish out the chapter here so we can make it a complete chapter. Praise the Lord. Verses 33 through 43. Now, he, he had just told Laban, give me these spotted things and you keep your very nice, clean, white ones. And and we, we know Jesus was talking about the Pharisees who are all whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but inside full of dead man's bones. They look nice on the outside, but they were not on the inside. Okay, I digress. Questions, comment? I, I have a comment. Uh, I just... I just realized or came to a realization that I am definitely a more than spotted and speckled. And 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 that's why the Lord brought me here, that I may be cleansed uh in him through through Christ. Praise the Amen. Lord. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Rufus. Yes. Uh the truth is we all are, whether we see it or not. And that's the amazing thing is that God can give us the revelation that we are not as great as we thought we were. And we're not as spotless as we thought we were. And his word reveals that it's sharper than a two edged sword. And it reveals the things in us when we thought, oh, when I thought I was a pretty righteous guy. And then God's word said, if you even were angry with a person without your cause, you, you committed murder. When you even lust after another person, you committed adultery. Then we see, oh, we are much more spotted than we thought we were. And we need a savior and praise the Lord that he comes for us. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Anyone else? Anything else? Yeah. That uh, the story Jesus gave of the Pharisee and the tax collector, the Pharisee said, oh, I'm glad I'm not like all these other people. I do all these religious things. I'm pure. I'm white. The tax collector recognized his own state. He said he couldn't even look up and said, I'm not worthy to even look up and be, be there. Well, the tax collector was justified because he understood his condition. The Pharisee did not. And that is a bad place to be. To think that we're perfect and we, we can make it on our own. Just look at the word and see it. it's not possible with man, not without God. Praise the Lord. All right. So now Jacob's made this deal or he's offering this deal. And he says to Laban, so my righteousness will answer for me in time to come when the subject of my wages comes before you. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it is with me. So we see he only comes for the broken. And Laban says, oh, that it were according to your word. He doesn't believe him. But he is going to do it. He is not going to take any of the pure sheep. He knows what he's doing. So he removed that day the male goats that were speckled and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted. Everyone that had some white in it and all the brown ones among the lambs, and gave them into the hand of his sons. Then he put three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flock. So he sent his away, and he stayed there feeding Laban's flocks. Now Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar, and of the almond and chestnut trees, peeled white strip, strips in them, and exposed the white which was in the rods. And the rods which had he had peeled, he set before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink so that they should conceive when they came to drink. So the flocks conceived before the rods and the flocks brought forth streaks, spe speckled and spotted. Now, uh, I believe God is doing this. I don't know what he thinks he's doing with this. And there might be some spiritual significance to this that I'm not aware of. Uh, but he's doing all this stuff. 
but more and more speckled and spotted sheep are, are coming out. I believe you could look at this as the word because if they're drinking from the spirit and reading the word, they're going to realize that they are streaked and speckled and spotted and produce a repentant soul. Then Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the street and all the brown and the flock of Laban. But he put his own flocks by themselves and did not put them with Laban's flock. And it came to pass, whenever the stronger livestock conceived, that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters, that they might conceive among the rods. But when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. So he's still trying to do a lot of supplanting and, and manipulation and all that kind of stuff. But God knows he's doing it. God's ultimately going to bless Jacob because not because he's righteous, but because he wants to bless him but from the, through the promise. So in other words... He wanted uh, the, the ones that were stronger to, to produce the spotted and speckled because they were valuable. But if they were weak, he didn't care. He let them go into Laban's flock, which were not going to be very productive. So here he is doing all this stuff. Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and he had large flocks, female and male servants and camels and donkeys. A man. All right. That's the end of the chapter. Yep. And so uh, before uh, we go any further, any other questions, comments, or revelations over anything we covered today? Uh, I do have something. Now, we also know that, and we haven't gotten to that point yet, but God will later change to take his name to Israel, which basically means from now on you'll be supplanting for me. That's right. And uh, so he uses Jacob just as he was for his, for his, uh, to serve him. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Rufus. And yes, we will see that in the days ahead, the weeks ahead. Praise the Lord. Anyone else? All right, then. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word today. And I just pray that you water any seeds that you've planted in our hearts and minds about how you show us Christ in every part of the Old Testament. You teach us spiritual things through the physical actions that are being taken. And we see here all the deception and everything else, but you're working it all for the blessing of those you've given the promise to. And that's that's what you do. And and. So we hopefully we can see that it's not by our righteous acts or how much we can accomplish that you're blessing us, but because you promised and you redeemed us with Jesus Christ on the cross is why we are blessed as well. You're not looking for us to accomplish a lot, but to sit at your feet, listen to your voice and do as you command us by your spirit and not by the letter of the law. And we'll all be as blessed as Jacob was in all of your children of promise. And so we thank you for that. Continue keeping us in this study. Continue revealing to us your truth and finish the work you started in us all. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Praise the Lord. For everyone here, for everyone listening in the future, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace today and forever in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you all. Hope to see you again next week. God bless. God bless. God bless.